Hey, everybody. Hey, Patrick, how are you doing? Good. Dan, it doesn't matter. We're just talking props. Hello. Hey. How are you, Patrick? Good. A little tired, but I'm good. Yeah, we all are tired. I'm still at work. Well, be at work and hear me. There you go. Tomorrow will be officially halfway there. I did as crazy as my week was last week, and I, I put the thing up late for a presenter. It's okay. If I just figure since students control is basically both chapters and both books, we'll combine it and talk about prompts. So doesn't matter what book you got, doesn't matter where you're studying from, we're gonna discuss prompts. Right. 
got a lot of people coming in. I used to number a lot of people in the same room. <clears throat> Gives people a chance to come in. Once we get going, it won't take long to, bam, it's already <laughs> all the slides. This figure is way easier to based on time and besides micromanaging one concept into the other. Yes, all my slides are available. It should be on the Rocket and Study Group um, page. If you're not a member, um, go ahead and join as long as you're a member of ABA Study Group. Um, and make sure, yeah, it's already there. I may have not posted it our, um, the prompting one yet. Usually I post before. Now I'm starting to doubt myself. Yeah, it should be in the files, but uh, I'll post it after we get done tonight. Usually I post everything before. I usually am a little bit slow though to post the YouTube videos about maybe a week or two later. I just been picking up my study and a little, my study pace has been picking up lately. And as I'm doing that, it's like, oh, okay, download this. And I'm getting more excited at work because the more I learn, the more I study, the more my eyes get more open to what I'm doing in a great way. Hey, Why? Patrick. Hey. Really quick, in the files, I'm looking at the files currently. What would it be called? Oh, you think you might not have posted it yet? Is I mean, right? I posted it yet because it'd be, it'd be called prompting if this one was posted. Okay. I posted last night uh, chapter 17 stimulus control because that yeah, would be sorry. this week's. So I went and posted that. And then I posted um, the, uh, the behavior last from change, the notes, and the uh, presentation. Gotcha. There should be the notes for chapter 17 also. There are. I started making my own notes about around this time last year. So it makes, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, those Cooper notes are great. The ones that are already made, already found. I got them all bindered up. But when I started doing it myself, it just, it forced me in the material. It just, it worked for me. That's why I have no problem sharing. The page is Rockin' Study Group. Just, we really encourage active participation and we check about monthly so if we're not active we do a purge because we want to keep our community not so much small on purpose but we only want people that are interested in actively pursuing you can find lots of study materials but we want people to you know not so much drop them off but you know community of learners <clears throat> I have found all of the vignettes, the questions, to be awesome. Oh, they're the best. Penny I covered up me. the answers. <laughs> oh, Penny pushed me, but it makes it helps so much because if you're struggling on a concept, to come up with the question and then come up with those answers. If and then if you and if you're wrong, you got people to back you up. Or if you're right, you got people to encourage you. So it's. It's great. It really is great. I recommend anything in your daily life. I know my people say mine are funny. But anything in your daily life that you could uh, tie the concepts to, just snap them into a vignette and throw it on, throw it on there. I think still must control. I'm having too much fun with my dog. I just I see so many of my dog comparisons with still must control. Yeah, I mean it, it. It really it helps so much. It really does because you. I think what's helped me out, I've been doing a lot more mocks, is the question I'm struggling with 
if you noticed last week, I made a bunch of questions, and those questions are based off concepts I was struggling with. But I figure if I was, I'm sure other people were too. So now I'm like, oh, I know what FM, DRO, and spaced interval and all that stuff now. Not an expert yet, but I feel a whole lot more comfortable. Yeah, it always helps. It always does. Oh, I wasn't watching the room. Got someone waiting to come in. All right, I guess I'll go ahead and get rolling. And people come in. I know it's, it's never a packed house because I do the Facebook Live and I record everything. Because I know how we all we, we're in different time zones where we got different schedules, different lives, and it just makes it easier. If you can't if you can't make it, you can always catch it. So that's a big reason behind that. It's not so much to be famous or be a whatever. I just I know how our lives are. And we're we're scattered across the globe. We're scattered across the country, and it's not always easy to make it for a, a certain time. So it really it's there to be helpful. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our topic tonight. The last several weeks of behavior lasting change has been going into stimulus control. Um, it's really been hitting it really hard with um, your SDs and your S deltas and all that good stuff. So it leads right into last night, which I didn't want to have like a repeat session of last night into today. His last night um, talked about faulty and tight stimulus control. So you want to have that tight stimulus control. And you also want to have, um, you don't want to have loose stimulus control. Well, prompting was right around the corner when it came to both chapters, but I wanted to hold off on to it. Prompting does have stimulus control. Pop prompting prompts are presented with an SD to get that response going. Um, I'm sure there's lots of people. Um, I know the Andy Bonnie topic was great. Um, that if you missed that conversation last year, it was incredible. He's a big proponent on fading out props. And he's so right in so many levels. What a lot of people do is they go from one prompt to the next, to the next, to the next, and we're not fading. So, so make sure when we, put a prompt in, we're fading out. But for the purposes of tonight and for the purposes of studying for our exam, we're going all prompts, whatever style. All right, a prompting. Prompting is applying a functional but irrelevant or contrived SD that evokes the desired response. We're gonna add that, that SD to evoke that desired response. Prompts are stimuli that control the desired behavior, but are not functional related to the task. So they help control the behavior, but they don't, they're not functional related. I may do a response prompt. I may, you know, I may do those things, but it's not related. All right, I, didn't, I was trying really hard not to say that. So in the chat box, can everyone tell me what two, what are the two main types of prompts? What are the two main types of prompts? There we go, there we go. Yes. Yes, good job, everybody. Now, I don't know why, but for the longest time, I could understand that stimulus and response, those are our two main categories, but I would get them all mixed up, and someone would give me a little trick, and I would see an acronym here, and it helped me remember over here, but what really helps me remember as of right now is stimulus prompt is the stimulus. I'm making changes to the stimulus. Response prompt is I'm doing a prompt to get a response. I'm prompting a response. I want a response out of it. All right, I had to throw in a, my dog once again because she's about the everything happening here. Um, 
when we use pro we have we need to use props effectively. This is from Mayer. This comes from the Mayer book. Um, Tarbo and Mittenberger have indicated three key guidelines that help us using prompting effectively. We present the stimulus, we prompt the correct behavior, and then we reinforce the correct behavior, whether prompted or not. And it just makes me think about my dog all over again. Um, she's been sleeping in the house lately and she's getting really spoiled because she's an outside dog and she sleeps in the backyard. But when we go to bed now, I don't want her in the, in the front of the house. I want her with me so I know what she's up to. And she probably won't lay in the bed too. So I had to prompt responses. I was really going for a shaping deal, but I had to prompt her every step of the way all the way to the back of the house. You know, first, I feel like a shading procedure really kind of going on, to be honest with you. But I would lead her all the way to, that, to the back with her collar and I was slowly kind of, I would, um, you know, obviously most the least lead her all the way with the physical prompt. And then I'll kind of, you know, back it up. We'll go to half the hallway to the couch and so forth. But my physical prompt was less and less and less and less over time. Because for one, he doesn't want me to walk her all the way to the bed with her leash, I mean her collar. I don't want to walk her all the way to the bed with her collar on. I want her to do it. So, I'm, so that's a great way of the this holding. I mean, I'm feeling dragging my dog around, but grabbing the the collar was the prompt to physically guide her in the right direction. I don't want to do that. So that gets that's a definitely something I want to gradually get off of and fade off of. And lately, it's been great. All I got to say now is. A verbal response, a verbal prompt, time to go to bed or let's go to bed. And she walks down the hallway by herself. She doesn't need me. Now, eventually it'd be kind of cool, you know, and there are some nights where I'll say anything at all. I'll go to bed, I'll lay back there, and here she comes. Because before, here comes that stimulus control part again. Before, every time she was led somewhere, every time she was told to go somewhere, it was always back outside. So that took time to teach that skill. There's props involved, but I want to fade off those props. You know, it kind of goes in a little bit of last night's habituation versus adaptation. You know, she was always cautious. And over time, she learned, ah, I get to lay in the bed. That was habituation. She got used to that response of being prompted to go lay in bed. A poor dog. She's the, the behavioral guinea pig, it seems like, all the time. All right. We're going to kind of jump back to, I think this is my Cooper notes here. Um, using response props and um, response to stimulus props. Um, like y'all said earlier in the, um, in the chat, we said response and we said stimulus props are our two major props. Um Remember, we think about response props, we're trying to trigger, we're trying to cue a response. When we're thinking about stimulus prompts, stimulus prompts, we're trying to change that stimulus to get us to go toward it. You know, we're, move, we're, pull, we're, we're moving that stimulus by positioning. We're putting a highlighter on it. We're changing the color with redundancy. You know, we have our within, we have our extra stimulus prompts. We're doing all those things to change the stimulus to make it more attractive um, for us to get that um, to get the stimulus. I probably I know I didn't quote the book, but I use a lot of the um, a lot of the upcoming slides, especially this one, comes from the ABA Visual Language. These are everything listed from ABA Visual Language. They have a picture. Yes. Situation. She got used. Um, the ABA visual language, they have a picture to go with it, a description of the prompt, and you know what's happened. To prompt. I left the book at work. I should have grabbed it. But a lot of the slides and that's kind of a lot of the slides and all this information, there it is right there. And Diana could back me up. The, a lot of this information, the next coming slides is word for word, literally. From I just made my own pictures. But it's great stuff. It's great stuff. 
But I want to keep reiterating, the main goal of prompting is to fade it out. We'll learn to be more independent. That prompt with my dog, I don't want to keep walking her up the hallway. I want her to do it on her own. I mean, all these physical prompts we do, do you really want to keep doing physical prompts? No, you want to learn to do it on their own. All these stimulus prompts, yeah, they're great. Airless learning, it's great. But what's our ultimate goal? The learner to do it on their own. What is most of these prompting? The airless? Yeah, that's what I thought too. Because airless is basically you're trying to get that correct answer every time. And that's how I was taught prompting. That's my, my first education and prompting was airless. The learner's always right. And then I start studying and I'm like, airless is great, but it's not really. You know, we need those, those I don't want to say failures, but we need those, we need successes on our own. Yeah, those visual pages are great. I bought ABA visual language. I'm still working my way through it. It's not as great as the ABA visual language, but it's great. All right, stimulus props. We have movement, we have position, and we have redundancy. Redundancy is kind of the, 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 the most attractive one to me out of the group because it has, you know, we're going to highlight it. We're going to add a sticker to it. We're going to do, we're going to change it and, you know, the dimensions of it to really grab our attention. We're going to make it um, black and white and the rest are color. You know, we're going to do some, we're going to do a, some kind of, we're going to change the dimensions up and really uh, make it redundant. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get that stimulus's attention. And then position cues, um, I think my first one of learning that one was the airless learning. We're going to move it on forward. We're going to, you know, he, here's the right answer. Um, I think every teacher in America does the, new, the movement cues. You know, we point, we tap, we touch, we look. Uh, we always look at the right answer. We always thinking about the right answer and hoping they can telepathically think what we're thinking about. But stimulus prompts, once again, are movement, position, and redundancy. Am I going too fast, too slow? Okay. You guys are great. All right. Here is a example straight from the ABA visual language. I changed the picture up and put different a little change of the, the picture up, but the words the same pretty much. Positional prompt, according to ABA visual language, is the teacher moves the stimulus closer to evoke the response. In this picture, she, I mean, I, we're just assuming that this woman in the picture is going to move it forward to get the right response. It may, it may be red, maybe blue. We're, we're just assuming she's moving it closer. So be a visual prompt. Um, visual prompt shows a picture, shows an object, shows writing that leads to the response. It's that visual. Um, last night, we also talked about visuals, those break cards, those visual schedules. Those things are lovely. Those things are beautiful. But the learner also has to have that skill in their repertoire. We could prompt all day long, but we need to also make sure they know what it is as well. Just a little soapbox from last night. Because then we have, there might be some more stimulus prompts trickled in, but I was trying really hard to kind of separate because I made a whole bunch for, for the presentation. Response prompts are modeling, verbal, and physical guidance. I put MVP in there because someone posted on a Facebook chat one day when I was struggling, struggling hard with response, response prompts, and that's helped me. Um, even if I couldn't remember the stimulus prompts, NVP for response prompts, then I knew the others would be stimulus response, stimulus prompts. Um, verbal instructions. Um, I think Mittenberger and even, um, I want to say, I was reading something, it may be Mittenberger, where when we look at uh, verbal 
it's not just spoken, but it's also unspoken. Then we have our directions, we have our instructions, we have our rules. Those are verbal instructions. Those are nonverbal instructions. And they're prompting a response. Modeling of the desired behavior. Um, best way to you know, have someone do something is to show them how to do it right. So demonstration of the, of the desired behavior, that's a prompt, that's modeling. And then of course, our physical guidance, just about tons of these different subtypes really fall into the physical guidance part. Hand over hand, um, the full physical, parcel physical, um, graduated guidance, most, most the least and least the most can still have a big part of physicality to it. So much falls into the physical part because we're physically, I'm not saying all prompts are physical for response, but there's so many response prompts that prompt physically how to do it right. And you don't want to have response prompts forever. Um, hand washing, especially in preschool, it's huge. What's the best way to prompt a child to wash their hands? We're going to show them how to do it. Um, if you're going to do backward chaining, what do we do the last step? Show them how to do it. You know, of course, we always assume they know how to wash their hands, but you always want to make sure that they're doing it. Brush, uh, brushing teeth. You know, we always say brush your teeth. Well, let's show them. Let's model. Um, a lot of these self-help skills would be great for modeling as well. Um, a direct uh, ABA visual language also has a directed verbal prompt. The prompt is where the teacher vocally demonstrates where on um, the entire response. Um, what do you like to eat? Cookie. They heard that last word, cookie. This is why we don't tell kids in the hallway who are running, please stop running. Last word they heard, running. We say, please walk. Not tell your kids don't run. Last word they heard was run. We could do a partial verbal prompt where the teacher demonstrates just part of it, kind of like an inner verbal in a way. Um, do you, what do you sit on? Neo chair. These are all ABA visual language examples, guys. These are great. Um, indirect verbal prompt where the teacher gives a verbal cue that could lead to the response, such as what's next or what do we do now? We're given those verbal clues now. Oh, I gotta wash my hands. How many of us have been there with the, been here with the learner? We don't want to tell them the next answer. We don't want to give the answer away. What do I do next? I love my own kid. My kid gets it the most. What do I do next? What's What's the next step? Um, of course, the full physical prompt. This is definitely a prompt you want to fade off. Do we always want to physically do hand over hand all the time? Probably not. I was just telling you my dog. I don't want to physically do a full physical prompt every night to the bedroom. But um, this is where we do the hand over hand to evoke that response. Um, obviously, the handwriting skill. He's having a difficult time getting it going, but we want to fade off that over, over time. We're showing her how to wash dishes. We could do it for hand um, skills. We could do it for tooth um, brushing teeth. Of course, I think that was more of a threat for my kid. We're not, if you, uh, I'll brush your teeth. I'll show you how to brush your teeth, but I never really did. I know threats or not, I know, but I just, how many kids actually want you to brush their teeth for them? I don't think there's a whole lot. Um, partial physical prompt where the teacher gives some physical assistance to both the response, um, such as tapping. We can go from our elbow to the shoulder. Uh, and graduated guidance goes from different, different spots, but we're not doing a full hand over hand. We're doing a tap. Gestural prompt. Couldn't find the best picture, so I got gestures or the or charades kind of happening here. But what are we doing? We're doing a gesture to evoke the response. I have all these response prompts, but didn't have enough stimulus. So, I mean, uh, I feel kind of, kind of bad now, but that's what I really had all together. 
Um, once again, like I said earlier, props and stimulus control, they do go together. Um, we are trying to transfer that power over time. We don't want to create prompt dependency. If the learner waits for a prompt for that cue to respond, that's what we don't want. We want to fade off. It's like we kind of we want to get in and then kind of get it out. Um, prompts should only be used during acquisition, and we want to eventually quickly transfer that control to natural existing stimuli. All right, transferring from response prompts. Here we have our most to least, we said earlier. Um, we physically guided the participant through the entire performance. We're starting with the most intrusive and then we're ending up with the least. On the flip side, with least to most, we're starting with natural, I can't, I can't say the right words right now, those natural um, things, and then we start to get more intrusive. Most of least starts very intrusive, and least of most doesn't. It just starts to kind of pick it up. When do you use least to most? That, that one makes the least sense to me since I'm not in the field but Usually, yet. I've never used it, so I really don't know. I've always done most to least. It just seems counterintuitive. Right. Or maybe you want the answer, but you're not getting it. You gave them the chance, and then you kind of kick it in a little bit. Maybe for a response prompt, maybe. Um, you gave the learner the chance to respond. They didn't do it right away. Like if I'm doing discrete trial or I'm doing some kind of learning activity with, with a child, um, I don't want to go right away. I know a lot of people say airless learning, but I don't want to go right away to that to that prompt. I can give the learner so, a chance. So would that be like in the classroom setting um, when, uh, so not an ABA setting, but a classroom setting, a teacher will ask a question and, and give a, a long pause before a little hint and maybe a more hint if nobody, is that? I would say it is most? because you, that, that the initial pause is we're giving the learner a chance to, uh, to get the answer and then they didn't okay. get it. So we're gonna drop a hint. Then we're gonna okay. drop a bigger hint, kind of like Wheel of Fortune, I guess. You know, we don't know it at first. Then we start putting those letters in, we're dropping more hints. And then finally. So it's not probably during actual acquisition, like the initial acquisition. It would be used once there's a likelihood that there has been some acquisition. I guess, I mean, it sounds like we're, that's what we're, we're both agreeing <laughs> on this. <laughs> Great to me. Uh, Alexandria says, I use it when I'm teaching a new skill. I don't want to go in with the most intrusive prompt right away if I don't need it. Yeah, I agree. So we're, kind of, we're more, more of the people are on the same page with us. You give the learner a chance, the new skill, they didn't get it. And then we bring in, then we start stacking the, stacking the things up. Because you don't always want to let them be, you know, be right or, or make it like my kid. I find myself a lot where he has to be inducing for him a new skill or, or something. And I'm like, you try it first. You know, you're, you're 10 and you're nine, you try it first. You know, if you need me, then I'll come in. But yeah, I give him a chance first. And if he, if he's struggling, then I'll, um, I'll get more intrusive. But I, I, I always go most to least. Yeah, probing for data, that's good. What does a learner know? What can a learner do? What things need prompting? Yeah, and the fewest um, first, and if the learner needs more prompts from Todd, um, the student already know the answer, but he learned a long time ago, a little prompt to, yeah, I agree. I agree with everybody. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, and the gradually reduced, of course, we just said earlier, um, we're gonna gradually reduce that physical assistance. From a model to verbal instruction to the natural. Um, Can I ask one more question? Yes. Go ahead. So, and, and maybe someone in the the comments. Uh, but, but so, isn't least to most still under errorless? And if it's still under errorless, like why is it still under errorless? It doesn't seem like errorless. <laughs> 
or maybe we have it backwards where they we gave the chance they got it wrong and then it becomes airless because out or maybe airless isn't most the least airless is uh, I don't somebody know. in the comments just said it's not airless no. excellent thank you i just I get confused when I try to put airless with all that because airless to me is like they're always right. You're always, yeah, it's it's not least to most because they're always right. But I don't know. We're kind of we're kind of spitballing and I'm getting I'm trying to scrap a little bit to help you out on that, but we got some good answers in the chat. Some great stuff going on. Totally agree. Thank you so much. All right. You guys have been great tonight. Okay. All right. Let's get to graduated guidance. And like I said, I'll have a whole lot. You guys have been great. Graduate guidance and meet leaf fade physical props. Um, it falls and participate closely with hands and it gradually can increases the distance between the hands and the participant. Um, basically what I'm getting out of that is we're, gra we're, gra um, we're giving the participant guidance and we're following them closely. Here comes the, the topic of tonight. Yeah, definitely. You don't want to get the, the prompt bearer and what they need. Totally, totally agree. Um, topic of the night, least to most. Like we said earlier, we're going to provide the participant with an opportunity to perform the response on their own. And then we're going to start kicking it up a notch. We're going to start picking it up. Um, time delay, varying the time interval between the presentation of the natural stimulus and the presentation of the prompt. This was a question on the mock and it just got me. Constant time delay and progressive time delay. Um, they're kind of like, AK, they're kind of, they go together. I don't want to say AKAs, they go together. Make sure that you're, you guys remember that those delays, they go together. Um, constant time delay begin with the zero second delay. And then we have a fixed time delay. Progressive. It is what it says. We're gonna we're gonna gradually, progressively increase that delay. Because we have our natural stimulus, and then we just increase that delay for the from the prompt. Then of course we have our stimulus fading. That's our ultimate goal, of course, to fade stimuli, um, to fade the prompts out. Highlighting a physical dimension and gradually fading that exaggerated dimension. That stimulus fading, we're, we're going to take out the highlighter. We're going to take out those extra colors. We're going to take out the sticker. We're going to take out those changes that we made the dimensions. Um, superimpose one stimulus on top of each other and gradually fading it out. Um, the, the transformations, I don't know if a lot of people use them, but there was an example in our, in our group with the um, the caveman, the guy uh, barbecue grilling, and the, the words were cave with the cave, and the table was the words. Um, those words are transformed into the person also or the object. And when the stimulus, the stimulus shape transformations, we're, we're making those transformations as well. Um, we use initial stimulus shape to prompt a correct response, and the shape is gradually changed to form the natural stimulus while maintaining the correct responding. I think that picture is the best example of that that I saw, and it's on our group. Oh, uh. I pressed something. I'm still a little bit confused on stimulus shape transition myself. Is anybody more comfortable with it? Because I know there's a, there's a page in the Cooper that talks about it. Where it, it Hi, Patrick. So I use it with one of my clients. This is Jolly, by the way. Hi. Um, so stimulus shape transformation, what I did was, was teaching him car, like how to read the word car. So the way I wrote car was in the shape of the car. And then I slowly started moving it towards how car would look, actually look like the actual word. So then he could know, he knew it's got, and then I taught him Coke. So I make Coke in the shape of the bottle and then we 
faded, faded, faded to the actual word cope, what cope would look like. And that was stimulus shape transformation. So you can do it with even ball or um, cup. So these are simple words like that you would teach like simple nouns that you would teach them first to read other than the sight words. So this was the best way to teach him. The other way was, I think you already covered that, um, the stimulus fading where you would, I would, I was teaching him the word ship. So I would uh, have the picture of the ship uh, very dark and then the word ship under that. And then I would gradually fade the, sh the picture of the ship and keep the, the word ship under that in the same font and same color. And slowly, gradually after five times, the ship is gone and he can only see the word ship and he was able to get it. And if he couldn't, I would go back to one picture for as a prompt and then I would quickly remove that visual. Another way that um, I help kind of discriminate is the uh, stimulus fading is more like, um, like Patrick said, removing a dimension. So um, like was mentioned before, the, the darkness of the letter of the color. So um, the, the shape of it is still the same. You're just changing some dimension, whether it's the color where the transformation is you're actually changing the whole stimuli to be, whether it's the word or the picture of the car. So the actual form of the stimuli is changing. It's literally like, I think a transformer. It's, you're transforming the, the stimulus into like, for example, the word. Yeah. It's transforming yeah. into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Gradually yeah. though. Good job, everybody. Well, that's all I have. That's why I just want to limit it to prompts because 17 had a lot of good stuff and stimulus control was the, was kind of the hot topic and, and both book studies to be honest with you. Um, I'll post this to Rockin, the, this PowerPoint. It, it's just, if, if it's helpful to anybody, uh, that's the reason why I try to do all that. Um, I'm not sure what's happening next week. Um, Cause I don't really look at the chapters ahead. Just know the next is 18 in both books. So it's eight, chapter 18 in Behavior Lasting Change and chapter 18 in Cooper. Um, I follow the third edition, but if you have second, it's fine. Or I'm just trying to follow the material. That's all we're trying to do. But I appreciate y'all very, very much. And um, I'll see y'all soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Patrick. Patrick.